Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. One thing that I love about the Bible, and, and, and I want to make this very clear, like you got to love God's Word. And the reason you have to love God's word um, is not only because it's God's word, but God has given us a, a manual that helps us understand how we function. And not only helps us understand how we function, but God has given us his word that has become our tools in order for us to accomplish whatever it is that God has designed us and created us to accomplish on this earth. Every single one of us here in this room is important to God's team, every single one of us. And I love God's word because you know what? Um, you look at God's word and all throughout scripture from Old Testament to New Testament, there's so many illustrations when it comes to sports. There's so many illustrations. And I understand more and more as you watch all these different games, like that's why we did a collage of all the different sports, is because each sport has contact. Everybody say contact. And I need you to understand that when you are living for God, when you walk with God, when you are trying to fulfill your purpose with God, there is going to be conflict. There's going to be an opponent. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. It comes with this sport called contact. And all throughout scripture, we see that there was a constant contact with an opposing enemy called Satan. And Satan wants to destroy us. Satan wants to beat us down. Satan wants to continue to take our wonderful, beautiful gift called emotions, and he wants to keep twisting them and messing with them so that then we, in return, don't give God everything, all the praise, all the worship that he deserves. Amen? Because have you noticed, we are people of emotions. We are people of feelings. Sometimes you feel like clapping. Other times you don't. Sometimes when the worship, he says, let's lift our hands to heaven. I don't want to lift my hands to heaven. You know, I'm not feeling that today. And so there is a battle. There's an internal battle, but there's also an external battle as well. And, and it's, it's Satan and all his enemies. You have to know that you have an opponent. You have an enemy. You have an adversary. You have uh, an enemy that wants to see you uh, not fulfill what God has called you to. But I love the fact that the Bible literally opens our eyes up. As you watch the game today, you realize there's so many principles and, and so many values that we can get out of this word that really helps us. Look at what 2 Timothy 2, 5 says. It says, it is the same. Everybody say, it is the same. So Timothy has this revelation. Hey, guys, he's saying life, life is the same like the sport contact that happens in a game. It's the same. He says, it is the same for anyone who takes part in a sport. So if you decide that you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to realize that it is the same like you decided to be a part of a sport. It's the same. It's the same thing. And I'll explain what that looks like. It says, they don't receive the winner's crown unless they play by the rules. They don't receive a winner's crown Unless they play, you're not going to receive the crown of glory. Okay, when you and I expire, when you and I die, when you and I leave this earth, we are going to receive a crown of glory. It's a crown. It's a reward. And just like so many of us, we work so hard because we like the return. We like the rewards that comes with our efforts, with our hard work, right, with our passion, with our suffering sometimes. We love to see the fruit of our labor, I mean, I know I do. Does anybody like to see the fruit of the labor? Like, you want to make sure that your life counts for something. You want to make sure that you're in it for a reason. And that you're not just, you're not just a Christian because, you know what, God gave me salvation, therefore, I'm the title Christian. No, I'm in the game, and I'm ready to play it. And I'm ready to receive this crown of glory, this reward that heaven has for me. And so Timothy here is basically giving us some understanding that, that this life that you and I are living right now, it's like a sport. It's like it. There's contact. There's, there's suffering. There's pain. And, uh, and I know that today, if, 
if, if we were to interview, like I said, the players uh, both, both woke up today, I promise you, saying we're going to win today. So it's not, it's not whether you feel like you're going to win. You have to decide, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to fight. And that's a challenge in itself because our feelings will dictate many times the decisions we're going to make next. But praise God, like I said, you already made it here, so uh, that's awesome. And, and you know, one, one of the reasons I, I, I love football is because of contact. I, I think for me, being a kid, growing up with so much anger, it was almost like a relief to be able to hit someone. Now, in my time, we didn't use all the nice, fluffy, you know, pads and, 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 the, and the supports and, and the helmets and all that. We played street ball. And I'll never forget when one day we had this new kid that came to our neighborhood. We didn't have parks around our neighborhood because I grew up like a very low. It was below uh, poverty level. Uh, it was the neighborhood. It was gang infested, drug infested. I mean, we had murders in broad daylight. And, uh, and I remember we used to play in the alley. And, uh, and it was tackle football. We couldn't even afford flags. You know, so it was tackle. It's street ball. And I remember this new kid came in, just moved into the neighborhood. And I'll never forget, he caught the ball. He was the, one of the receivers. And when he caught it, I pushed him hard. And he hit the ground, and, man, he was all, and he got up so mad, like, he wanted to fight me. I'm like, dude, calm down, man. This is how, you're in the game, bro. You're, this, this. But so many of us as Christians, you get saved. Come on, God does something special in you. And then all of a sudden, you start facing some challenges, some difficulties. And it's like, you know what? The enemy threw you to the ground, and you're getting up, and you're complaining, like, man, why'd you push me to the ground? Here's the reality. Walking with Christ, living this life is like a sport. There are going to be hits, okay? And when you look at football, you have to understand, regardless of the helmets, despite the helmets, despite the pads, despite the braces and the supports, injuries are a common part of the game. Everybody say injuries. It's part of the game. When, when, when I have seen so many interviews of football players, which it's cool to see um, Blair. Blair used to play for the Patriots, and I love that God brought him to this church. I'm like, yes. And then I had another, I had another Patriots guy, uh, McGregor. He gave me this football, and he gave me his rookie card, and he signed it and everything. So I'm, I'm a Patriot follower, man. I love the Patriots. God bless the Patriots today, Lord. <laughs> bless them. Thank you, Father. I know you, uh, you're a respecter of no person. <laughs> but please respect me today, Father. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. There's, there's, there's contact that comes with it. But one thing that I have seen in many interviews of football players is that each and every single one of them have a common thread of what they say. They said, when they ask them, so how are you feeling? And they always ask, how are you feeling? Meaning physically, how do they feel? And they will all respond this way. None of us operate at 100% capacity in our physical condition. None of us. Why? Because think about it. They have been living a career of hits. You and I as Christian followers, we are living a life of hits. We are living lives of pain, lives of suffering, lives of torment. But we're also living lives of victory, lives of breakthrough, lives of comeback, lives of reward, lives of blessing. And so it's, 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 a, it's a brutal thing, right? Life is brutal. It's brutal, but it's beautiful. And I love that about our life because you know what? Without the brutality of this life, man, we would be these weak Christians, I don't know about you, but I'm not a weak Christian. Are you a weak Christian? Heck to the no, we're not. No, we're, 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 we're strong in the Lord. And so despite the helmets, the pads, the braces, uh, all the stuff to support, there is a common thread in every single sport, and that is injuries. And so what I did is like, okay, God, how do I say this to them? So I rewrote this. Look at this. Uh, life is a rough sport. Read this with me. Ready? One, two, three. Life is a rough sport. And despite your helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your shield of faith, belt of truth, and sword of the spirit, injuries and obstacles are a common part of the game. So it don't matter if you got all the equipment, you got all the tools. 
God says, I've given you the armor of God. But just because you have an armor, it doesn't mean you're not going to take a hit. Listen, these guys that are in the Super Bowl today, do you think they got there because they had pretty uniforms? No. Do you think they got there because they're all buff and cut and all that? No. They got there because they were willing to endure and persevere this season of pain, and therefore today they get rewarded. You and I, we are to go ahead and allow ourselves to understand that there's going to be seasons of great blessing, but there's also going to be seasons of great setbacks, seasons of great pain. But at the end of the day, it's always rewarding. It's always going to be worth our time. And um, I, I can't wait for the hits today. It's going to be awesome. But, but, but this should be told to every Christian, huh? Like, I think as Christians, we forget that we're going to get hit in life. I, I think it's so easy um, to get hit. And then, and, and you, listen, there's two types of people, people. There's winners and there's whiners. Well, three. And then there's winos, right? So, but, but you have to ask yourself, which one am I? Right? I, I'm, I'm a winner. And, and listen, and, and just because you may not be winning in life right now, that doesn't mean that you're not a winner. Okay? Being a winner is making a decision. I'm not quitting, regardless of how bad it looks right now. I won't quit. I won't stop. What do you do when you get hit? You get back up. What do you do when you get hit again? You get back up. What do you do when you get hit the third time? Lay there for a little bit so the enemy walks away, then you get back up. <laughs> but they're not functioning at 100%. And so I started looking at the common injuries of a football team. And here's some. Uh, fractures is a common injury that they have. What do I mean by that? They have fractured bones. They have fractured fingers. Can you imagine that? They're, they're playing while they're fractured. They got fractured legs, fractured fingers, they got fractures everywhere. And I know that so many of us here right now, we have been fractured in our heart. We have been fractured in our emotions. We have been fractured in our relationships. There have been some fractures in some capacity in your life. But here's the truth, that though there are fractures that we experience in this life, that shouldn't determine whether or not I'm going to keep going. It, shouldn't, it should not make the decision that I'm going to go ahead and sit on a bench. I'm not saying deny the fact that you have been fractured. But what I am saying is don't let that fracture keep you from pushing forward. You can't let that happen. So fractures is a big one. We're talking about legs. How about this one? Turf toe. Turf toe is a big one. What's turf toe? Man, they're running on the turf. They jump, ready to receive the, the ball, right? Just like many of you, you're running with God. God says, okay, Mauricio, I'm, I'm giving you vision, gives you a vision, says so start out, and you catch it, and at first you're excited because you're catching it, and then you fall on your toe. Have you ever had your toe just, that hurts. It hurts. Well, that's a common injury. So many times you can be running the will of God. You can be running the race of God. You can be running the plan of God, but through it there are times where you're going to have some turf toe as you're running. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. There's also um, uh, uh, ankle sprains. There's Achilles tendonitis, which is a big one for them. That's when uh, the, 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 the back of the ankle, if you've ever hit yourself, have you ever got up from something or from somewhere and you, like, hit the back of your ankle? Man, that is the most painful thing. Well, there's a lot of uh, tendonitis that happens there. The ACL tears, that's the ligaments of the knees. They, a lot of these players, they got knee issues. They got back issues. But they still play today. Torn cartilages. They have concussions. Come on, they get hit, ramped. I remember when Alexis, when you had your accident, this girl had a brain concussion and a spinal concussion. And uh, it was bad. But, man, I'll tell you, we got back from vacation, and she was all with a, a, a neck brace and everything. And she was up here worshiping God, leading the church in worship. I'm like, good Lord, Jesus, how does she do that? That's not wisdom. No, you know what? You're right. It may not be wisdom, but the Bible says in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, so be it unto you. Amen? It's not according to what everybody thinks. It's according to my faith. It's according to what I'm believing God to do. And that young girl got up here, and she led this church like nobody's business. Man, God's presence fell in this place. I believe that the greatest miracles, the greatest breakthroughs, the greatest and most awesome things that God will do is when people are willing to play hurt. It's quiet in this Pentecostal church. 
But it happens. It means that you have to learn how to, how to play in pain. Listen, I'm going to say this again. I'm not saying deny pain. I'm not saying don't stop and check the pain. You should check the pain because that's the only way you identify what happened. But what I am saying is don't you let a little bit of pain keep you from fulfilling what God wants you to accomplish in your family, in your children, in, in your career, in your business. If, if not, then you will, you will begin to tolerate. You'll tolerate the fact that the bench is more comfortable and you'll just watch everybody else play and you'll never get in the game. And God wants each and every single one of us to get in the game and play. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible. The Apostle Paul, perfect example, he had an end game in mind. Check this out. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Stay with me here, okay? Paul said this. He understood game. He understood sports. Read throughout the scriptures. He always used a sport as an illustration. He used boxing as an illustration. He used all kinds of analogies. But look at this. He says, I have not yet received all these things. And I love that because right now, many of us right, right now, we know that we have yet to receive everything we desire for God to give us. There are some things that we have been believing God for that you have yet to receive. But notice that Paul doesn't start complaining about what he didn't receive. His statement is this, I have yet to receive. In other words, I'm still believing I'm going to receive it. I have just yet to see it. So I still know it's going to happen. I have yet to see it. So he says, I have not yet received all these things. I have not yet reached my goal. Uh, you like our goal post, right? Every single one of us, we have, we have an end game. And the most important end game of your life, my life, is eternity. It's called salvation. In other words, where are you going to spend the rest of your eternal life? Because there's two places. Heaven, which God created for all his kids. Hell, God, God created that place for Satan and all his demons, right? And so my end game is that we as parents, we as fathers, we got to lead our family into eternity. Amen? That's our end game for every single man. And so he says, I have yet to reach my goal. But look at this. Christ Jesus took a hold of me so that I could reach that goal. In other words, there's, there's, there's only so much you can do. But you can do so much more with Jesus. There's only so much you and I can do. Maybe you're a business person here. Maybe you're an entrepreneur. Maybe you're someone that is pursuing a, 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 a career. You're, you're ready to step into your, your call. I don't know what you do. Maybe you work for a big corporation. But let me tell you something. There's, there's, there's what you can do, and then there's what God can do with you. And he can help you reach the goal so much faster. What you can do in five years, God can do in two. What you can do in two, God can do in six months. And so Paul was saying, he's literally telling the church, hey, guys, I've been learning some things. Uh, before I came to Christ, because we know the story of the apostle Paul. Paul was someone who committed martyrs. He was the one who gave the green light. He was like, like the, 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 the gangster of, of giving the green light of, of who should be killed. And, and he did it all in the name of God. Obviously, he was so confused and blinded by the enemy. And he realized that, you know what, when I was, when I was doing it my way, I, I wasn't accomplishing much. And so he's saying, guys, please get a hold of this. You, when, you, when you do this with Jesus Christ, you're going to fulfill the goal. You're going to reach the goal. Look what he says. He says, Christ Jesus took a hold of me so that I could reach that goal. So look at this. I love this part. So I keep pushing myself forward to reach it. And this is so key. I want you to get this. He says, I keep pushing myself. I keep. So many times we're just waiting for God to push us. Like, push me, God. You know, God's giving you a call. Okay, God, I'm just waiting on God. Just push me into destiny. <laughs> and, and, and listen, if not careful, you're going to be waiting there just waiting for God to push you. But Paul's saying, hey, let me tell you something. There, there's something you have to understand. Yes, Christ will help me reach that goal, but I have to keep pushing myself. Look, at, I have to keep pushing myself forward to reach it. In other words, no one is going to motivate you the way you're going to motivate yourself. Now, I love, listen, I love people. I like, you know, when people are like, Pastor, that's awesome. I like that. That's cool. I enjoy that. But I don't live off of the praises of man. I, I live 
to praise my God. And the only way I can do that is I got to literally wake up every single day and be self-motivated and say, today is going to be an awesome day. Today is going to be a day of great salvations at Elevate Church. Today will be a day of great deliverance at this church. Today will be a day where we're going to see some change and transformation. But I have to encourage myself. I have to push myself forward. And notice he uses the word pushing. Like right now you're watching me, right? Got my cool jersey on. Did that look difficult? Did that look challenging? Did that look like I, you know, had a turf toe? No. No, come here, baby. Let's just, it's my girl. That's why I call her baby, so relax. <laughs> oh, my God, was this pastor girl? And so, so, so I'm going to try to run. Or better yet, you try to run because I'm your daddy. Come here, baby. Come here, baby. So, 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 so try to run again. Run across. Come on. Go ahead. Push. Push. Good girl. So, so listen. Here's, here's a simple point. I keep pushing myself forward. What, please stay with me. What is he saying? Paul's saying, everything I'm doing right now is a push everything. In other words, Paul's saying right now, this season that I'm in is a push season. Women, you know very well. Moms, you know very well about push, right? You're at the hospital. You're ready to give birth to your dream. You're ready to give birth to your baby. You've been anticipating. You've been waiting. You've been, but unless you push, you will not see that dream, and so the doctor says, push. Your husband says, push. And you want to just smack both of them because you know you're pushing. I am pushing. And so Paul is saying, I am pushing myself forward to reach it. And so, listen, the things that you want to accomplish, please understand this, church. We have become so, so complacent sometimes. And we just think that, that by, by just waiting and that God's going to make everything happen Read your Bible. Every single disciple had to push forward constantly. And, and, and each one of them had to encourage himself. And that's why David said, I encourage myself in the Lord daily. David. Why? Because discouragement wants to come in. Disappointment wants to come in. Dissatisfaction wants to come in. All the disses wants to come to diss you. And you start feeling very distant. So he says, but I got to push myself. Look at your mirror and just give him a little push. He'd be like, come on, you got this. I love Paul. <clears throat> look, look how he starts off the next verse. He says, brothers and sisters, I don't consider that I have taken hold of it yet. Notice he keeps saying yet. Like I may not have it Yet. I may not be there yet. I may not be that person that I want to be yet, but I'm pushing forward. Listen, anything that's going to be worthwhile and worth your time requires push. Push. And notice that push means that there's going to be a push back. It's not just a push forward. It's a push back. You may push and, and get 10 yards. But you may get pushed back 20 more yards. But the key is you keep pushing. That's why Paul said, I keep pushing. It doesn't stop pushing. I won't quit. I won't stop. And he says, I don't consider that I have yet, have taken a hold of it yet. But here is the one thing I do. Paul, Paul, Paul's saying, listen, what I have learned in this whole experience of pushing, he said, there's one thing that helped me from being pushed back to pushing forward. He said, the one thing I have learned to do, he says, I forget what is behind me, and I push hard toward what is ahead of me. And isn't that uh, the most difficult thing to do, is to try to forget your past. Most of us, most people in this life, they live always in the past. 
constant living. There, there's this constant shame of your past, constant guilt of your past, constant condemnation of your past. And so why did Paul say, this is the one thing I've learned? The one thing I do is that I have to let go of my past. I have to let go of my failures. I have to let go of my setbacks. Yes, we have two great teams today playing at Super Bowl, but both teams have had wins and both teams have had losses. But right now they're in the season of winning. Amen? And so Paul's saying, hey, but one thing I have learned in this journey of pushing is I have to let go of my past life. Why his past life? Well, we know that Paul was, he was martyring Christians. Can you imagine that? Now he's saved. He's walking with Christ. And he has this lingering thing over his head. You murderer. How are people going to receive you? How are people going to want to accept you? You have all these things in your past. Like so many of us, we have a past. You know, sometimes people, they, they don't like, they don't like connecting with certain people because they can't let go of their past. Even though they may be changed today, but they still can't let go of the idea. For example, sometimes people don't receive me very well because the moment they hear my testimony that I was in, in deep gangs and violence and drugs, they, it's almost like they just get turned off. It's like, dude, that was like, you know, 30 years ago. Calm the heck down. You know, this is a new person. And isn't it interesting that if you're not careful, you have to make sure that you have the people that are going to push with you and not push against you. You got to have the right they in your life. You got to have the right people that are going to also empower you and encourage you. But let me tell you something. But I have to learn how to push through. Because here's the truth. When you finally have the confidence of your freedom, it doesn't matter what anybody says. When God has a divine plan, when God has a divine play, you will make it to the goal. You will make it. I promise you. How do you take an ex-gangbanger, drug-infested, dysfunctional person, and now I get to stand before government officials and people that are so important? How is that possible? Because what I used to do on my own, I could only achieve so much. But when I got Christ in me, now I can achieve so much more. How do you do that? His name is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No other way. Man, he'll, carry, he'll help you carry that ball. Just favor. In February, we're going to be in a global summit of all nations. And they've given us the platform to speak. How is that possible? When you carry the ball for Jesus. That's how that's possible. When you do it your way, you get only a few yards. When you do it God's way, you get some touchdowns. Amen. Amen. Let's keep reading. Are you good? Is it warm in here or am I just warm? <laughs> oh, Jesus. It's just always against me. Always. It's just always push back, push back. Just kidding. Everybody say push hard. So he didn't just say, it, I push forward. I push hard. I don't just push forward, I push hard. Why? Because the harder I push, the harder the pushback. But eventually, there's going to be a breakthrough. Eventually, there's going to be a break forth, and you're going to get some touch touchdowns. Verse 14 says, I push myself forward. I push myself forward toward the goal to win the prize. God has appointed me to win it. Look at this. The heavenly prize is Christ Jesus himself. I, I love what he said here. Think about this. He says, I push myself forward toward the goal to win the prize. And then I, for me, I put a question. But why do you push forward, Paul? He says, the reason I push forward is because God has appointed me to win. That's why. Why, why do you always want to win? Because God has appointed me and anointed me to win. Why do you want to be a better parent? Because God has appointed me to win as a parent. Why do you want to be a better spouse? Because God has appointed me to be a better spouse. Why do you want to, you know, why do you want to be this amazing, big, huge corporation? Because God has appointed me to be a winner, but also to build his kingdom. Amen? God, that's why we win. We don't just, we're not just these arrogant, you know, people that are just saying, yeah, we win in Jesus. No, we've, we've been appointed. Jesus did all the suffering. Jesus went through all the pain. Jesus sacrificed his life, not so that we can be losers, but that we can be winners. Amen? Remember, once again, it's not based on what you feel. It's based on what you know. You may feel like a loser right now, but you're not. So don't trust your feelings so often. Once you come to that place of faith, let me tell you something. When you start faithing, what's faithing? When I start trusting God, when I start following Jesus, when I start believing Jesus, here's what happens. My feelings will line up with my faith. But it starts with faith. 
it starts with faith. And so the Apostle Paul is, is saying, man, you guys... You guys got to push hard. You have to understand that God appointed you to push hard. God appointed you to push forward. God appointed you to, to win. This is what God appointed every single one of us. It is not an option. God doesn't negotiate with us. God says, you're my child. You're a winner. I mean, as a parent, do you ever tell your children that they're losers? Like, oh, you're a loser the rest of your life. Now, if the parents are on drugs, maybe. But... I think every single one of us that are parents, I look at my daughter and I always tell her, you're anointed. You're called by God. Man, God's going to do amazing things. God's going to open doors for you that no man can shut. God's going to expand you. God's going to increase your influence. I speak life into them. Why? Because they're winners. They're winners in Jesus. Are they always winners? No. But it's not about what I do. It's about who I am. Say it with me. I'm a winner. Amen. Yeah, why? Why does he want us to win? Well, you know, we gotta we gotta overcome. God wants us to overcome some depression. God wants us to overcome anxieties and fears and doubts. God wants us to overcome unbelief. Those are those are the opponents that you and I constantly deal with. And yes, you hear me preach about this, but there's still people that are stuck there. It's good for the moment, but then you leave and then what happens? Then what do you do with that ball? Are you running the ball or are you fumbling the ball? You know, are you, are you getting fouled? Are you sitting on the bench? But we got to push through the obstacles. Here's what 1 Timothy 6, 12 says. It says, fight the what? Good fight. Of what? Faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never, I've never experienced a good fight. So it's almost like an oxymoron, right? You read, fight the good fight. I'm thinking, there's nothing good about a fight, period. Right? Because there's, listen, think about it. There's, there's, there's a lot of bad fights. Like there's, there's bad fights. There's stupid fights. Like maybe some of you had a stupid fight before you got here, right? Right? In the morning you wake up, you had a stupid fight. There's, so there's, 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 there's fights that just suck the energy out of you. You know, so there's all kinds of fights. But when you begin to read what God is saying, you know what? God, this is why God says this. He says, and, and, and what the devil meant for bad, I turn it around for your. Do you see that? What the enemy meant for bad, whatever bad you're fa facing right now, God says, that's okay, because I know how to turn bad into good. And so it's not a matter of, of being focused on having these bad fights with the flesh and with our physical nature of always trying to react. Uh, God's saying, hey, listen, I'm, I'm wanting you to start fighting the good fight of faith. Start living in faith. Start trusting me in every situation, no matter what the experience is, no matter what the trial is, no matter what the trouble is. He's saying, I want you to fight the good fight, and his fight is worth fighting for. Our fight is not worth fighting for. It literally just sucks life out of us. But his fight, the good fight of faith, it's a whole nother level. It does something super amazing. And look at this, Romans 12, 21. Now look. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Let's talk about this quickly. We can get the piano on already. Thank you. When we think of evil, we think of these big demons, or we think like this really out there sin that's just like so, like that's all we can focus on, right? But how many know it's the little foxes that spoil the whole vine? So when, 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 when we read this verse right here, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Evil can be as small as your worries. That's evil. When you're worried, constantly worried, when you're constantly doubting, that's evil. It's evil. Uh, why are you saying like that? Because let's call it what it is. When you're living in fear, that is evil. How do I know that? Read your Bible. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God did not give you a spirit of what? fear but he gave you spirit of what power love and a sound mind and so when you are living contrary then you are now in conflict and that's evil and god says and do not be overcome with evil but overcome evil with what good evil can be things that are pulling you off course relationships it's amazing how many of us if not careful we can defend the, 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 the toxicity of our relationships just because, but I grew up with them since junior high, but they're toxic every single time. So you rather, you rather defend the toxicity than to defend your faith. That can be evil. 
Anything that's distracting you from God's divine purpose is evil. Money can distract you. Fame will distract you. Wants can distract you. That is evil. And so what does God say? He says, hey, church, when evil comes, you got to return it with some good now. Because I'm the God that takes everything that's bad and I use it for good. How do I do that? Well, you know what? Today, maybe you're someone here that is challenged where you have a bad attitude. Do you know bad attitudes is, is obviously it's not good. So if it's not good, it must be what? Bad. And, and the scripture uses the word bad as what? Evil. If you always have this bad attitude, negativity, is that good or evil? Do you see how easy it is to be evil? It's so easy. But we have such a good God. Come on, things that are keeping you emotionally unstable is evil. Thoughts that keep tormenting you. Voices of the enemy that keep telling you, you're not good enough, you're worthless, you'll never amount to nothing. That's evil. And, and that's why I read you that verse where Paul said, man, the one thing I have learned is to leave what's behind where it belongs, behind me. And I push forward. If you're not careful, evil will put you to sleep like a baby. And then you're, you wake up one day and you're like, man, I lost a year of my life. I lost two years of my life. I lost five years of my life. Do you know that not obeying God is evil? When God puts something on your heart and we don't respond quickly, it's evil. When God says forgive and you don't want to forgive, that's evil. When God says love and you don't feel like loving, that's evil. And God says, no, we're going to start switching this up. We're going to change it. See, it's not just about what God said. It's about what I'm going to do with what God said. What am I going to do? And there's... This evil comes with conflict at work. There's some evil people at work, amen? Huh? You're probably thinking of that person. You could probably see that person's face right now. And if they're sitting next to you, just say nothing. No, listen, spouses, we can be evil. See, the truth will set us free. Sometimes we can be evil. We get up and we fight. That's evil. Arguments with your kids, that's the enemy's plot. What does he do? He wants to divide you. It's evil. Frustration. Any frustrated people in this house? Listen, frustration is evil. Here's the reality. And that's, I'm, I, I think I've told on myself, I deal with that issue. I'm, I'm easily frustrated because I love the spirit of excellence, but sometimes the spirit of excellence comes out in the spirit of perfection. And perfectionism is evil. Because there's only one who's per perfect, and his name is God. Amen. And so I've learned in my frustration is that I have to, the only way I can return good upon evil is that I have to realize that I have no control and I have no power over the frustrating situation that's annoying me. I can't control that. I can't. Now, I can remove things out of my personal life, but I can't remove necessarily things out of people's life that may frustrate me. It's evil. So we have to address that frustration that we deal with. Uh, and, 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 and listen, and I, I get it. We're going to be hurt. People have hurt you. People have mistreated you. People have talked, spoken ill of you. People have, have tried to damage your name. Been there, done that. Got the T-shirt. All of us. We've, 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 we've been done wrong. But, can, but, but how about we look at the, we point the finger at us, but what have you done wrong? Oh, I'll preach it right there. Yeah. We've all been evil. Every single person sitting here, we have all been evil. I'm not calling you the devil. Calm down. You can never come back to this church. No, I'm just telling you the truth. We all have an evil heart that must be guarded. That's why God says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the what? Issues. Yeah, the evilness of our heart. 
do you, let's, let me ask this question. Who here sees the best in everybody? See? You were good right now. Nobody sees the best in everybody. But how many know that we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling daily, right? And start being like, okay, I'm going to change my attitude over that because I'm going to return good upon what? Yes. Yes. Paul said, the one thing I do, I'm not looking back anymore. I got to push forward. But I can't be overcome by the evil because the evil is constantly reminding me, you know, Mauricio, you're not good enough, Mauricio. You're not smart enough, Mauricio. How are you gonna how are you gonna sustain all these responses? And that's evil. You know why? Because I if you're not careful, you start believing the thoughts and you start agreeing with those thoughts. And God didn't want you to agree with your thoughts, God wants you to agree with his word. And so when you start agreeing with your ideas, with your ideologies, with with your uh, you know, dysfunction, that's evil. And and the only way that we can combat that is, man, we gotta bring the word back and, and begin to declare who you really are in Jesus. Man, I'm a victor in Jesus Christ. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Come on, I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out, right? Come on, though a thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand more on my right hand, it will not come near me. What's that language? It's called a language of win. I'm going to win. I don't feel like a winner. Why aren't you glad that you don't live by feelings? You live by faith. Look at this. John 16, 33. Jesus said this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In who? In Jesus he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus didn't deny that you're going to be troubled. You may have the armor of God, but you will be troubled. But take heart. Another version says, but take courage because I have overcome the world. In other words, whatever it is you're facing right now, anything, whether it's physically in your body, whether it's emotionally, whether it's family related, Jesus says, I already been there and I overcame that. Now, our faith has to catch up with God's word and say, Lord, I, I touch and agree with what you just said. You have overcome the situation. When they said, Mauricio, you have cancer, I had to make a decision right there. No, Jesus already overcame cancer. Jesus already overcame whatever disease is being spoken over your life. He's already overcome that. But that, 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 has, to, that has to be a faith that starts building and mustering inside of you, not based on what you feel, but based on what you know. And he says, I have told you these things. This is how you're going to have my peace. When you finally learn to take heart and understand and believe that I have overcome the world. And he's very clear. You will have trouble. You will. Let me give you these last four points on how to overcome the Super Bowl of your life. Number one, very, very clear. You have to be unpredictable. Say unpredictable. Listen, Satan is an imitator while God is a creator. Satan will keep choosing the same play in your soul. Same play. Same, same drama, same issues, same, same challenges, same addictions. Nothing new under the sun. It's the same. So, so what do you do as a believer? You got to change the game. You, got, you can't keep being predictable. You got to be unpredictable. And like maybe, maybe you're someone that's challenged. Like you're not the nicest person. Okay, well, don't, don't focus on I got to be nice for the next 12 months. No, how about I'm going to be nice today. Just today. You walk in the restaurant and, 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 and you meet, you come across. Just be nice. Just today. Be unpredictable. See, the enemy already knows that you're going to react. But if you already wake up and you have a mindset of, man, God has appointed me to win, let me tell you something. When you know that you've been appointed to win, now you have leverage on the enemy. Why? Because now you're going to be unpredictable because I believe that I have been appointed to win. So today, I'm going to have an awesome attitude. Today, man, I'm going to be joyful. Today, I'm going to choose to smile. I'm not a smiler, but today I'll be a smiler. People may call me fake. Man, it ain't fake. I'm faithing it. There's faking it and faithing it. I'm faithing it right now. Amen. Be unpredictable because the enemy knows you. He already knows your, your play. He knows it very well. So you got to tell the enemy, you ain't playing me no more. This football team today, they ain't playing the same plays. As a matter of fact, right now in this Super Bowl, they're bringing a whole brand new game plan. Why? Because everybody has watched the Patriots and, 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 and Patriots have already watched the Rams. They know their place. So what do they have to do today? Be unpredictable. They got to change the game. Oh, you guys, you watched all that film for nothing because guess what? We got a whole new game for this one. Amen? 
Man, what if you woke up like that tomorrow and said, oh, devil, whoo, you in trouble? Huh? You know? You act like you're going to go to the bathroom and brush your teeth. Psych! No, I'm not. I'm going to have dragon bread today. You, you just change it up. Listen, what you change in the, in, the, in the natural, you'll end up changing in the spiritual. Why? There, that's, that's, there's a connection, you know? I'm not going to eat a burger today. Well, yeah, today you will Super Bowl. But, but tomorrow, I, I'm not going to eat bad. I'm going to eat a salad today. That's unpredictable. Satan's going to be like, man, I'm trying to destroy you. I'm trying to kill you and your health. Be unpredictable. Number two, energy. Thank you, Aaron. You're the only one. Thank you. Everybody say energy. energy. Isn't it amazing that, on, on, and I know many of you are like this, like all oh, saints, but, but many of you at Super Bowl game, you're going to be jumping off your couch. Why, why can't we have that kind of praise for God? That's just the game. This is my life. Energy. Look at what the Bible says about energy quickly. Philippians 2.23 says this, that energy is God's energy. Say this to me. Say my energy. It's God's energy. So if you don't have energy, then maybe you just don't have God energy. And he says, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Do you know that your energy brings honor and glory to God? Man, let's, let's bring some excitement to church. Amen? Let's get, right now, let's give God a big hand clap of praise. Real quick. A lot of energy. That brings him pleasure. Yeah. Come on. He won the Super Bowl of your life. Give it up. Yeah. Okay. He says, do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. No second guessing allowed. Huh? No second guessing. No whining. No bickering. No complaining. Man, I'm going to... I need energy. Number three, take risks. Say take risks. First Samuel 14, 6 says this, and Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come on, Jonathan, Jonathan, David's friend, he said, hey, here's what we're going to do. He says, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Another translation says it this way. The original says this, let's go and battle with our enemy. Take a risk. Look at this. He says, perhaps... Now notice this, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether, uh, whether by many or by few. So what was interesting as I read this, I thought like, wow. See, taking risks means that you don't have all the information. When you want to calculate everything and all the numbers need to make sense, that's not taking a risk. That's you still being involved. When God gives you something to do, it never calculates it never adds up. But one thing, like when God said, open the school, open this, open that, do this, do that, it doesn't calculate. But, Father, the finances of the church does not match what you want us to do. God's not saying, let's talk about the money. God's saying, let's talk about the risk. Let's talk about the vision. And I love what Jonathan said. He says, perhaps, perhaps, I love this, look at this, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Taking a risk sometimes means that you may make a failure, you may make a mistake, you may miss it, and that's okay. Because at least you were a risk taker willing to believe that God could back me up in this situation right now. And so many of us are afraid to risk again because you failed. Get back up and try again. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by may, many or by few. God's not afraid of numbers. And number four, ready for this one? Be a comeback team. Say, come back. Yeah. Some of us have been too comfortable in church. Just come in, go out. Come in. No, come back. Full force. All in. Jesus, take my life. Do something with my life. Get a comeback from God. Come on, say, God, I'm ready to, to do the, the, the amazing things you want to do in me through my church, through my house. This is God's platform. God, raise me up. Do something in me. Right? You need a comeback team. Look at what David said in Psalm 27, 13. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the what? Goodness of the Lord in the land of the living one. I think you have to take just the word see. Everybody say see. 
And the reason that this stuck out to me is because everybody sees different. Like some people here, when you see a problem, you have a solution. And then there's other people, when they see the solution, they create more problems. It's your perspective. It's your perception. You guys will make it. It's going to be amazing. You don't have to stress. You don't have to worry. God will provide. He provided yesterday. He provided today, and he'll provide forevermore. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? See how you see? Maybe you always see negative. Always everything's negative. Like, oh, oh here we go again. We're going down. No, calm down, dude. You're, you're still standing right now. You're not going down. We're going over. Yeah, but but I can't see it. Well, have you, has anyone here ever tasted the goodness of God? Okay, well, let that be your seat. I remember when God was good in that situation. Now I can see good again. Because God says, I do not, I do not return evil upon evil. I return good upon evil, even when it comes to you and me. When you're evil, he's good. When you're missing it, he's still good. Why? He loves you. He's like, come back. Because I'm a good God. Amen. That's what God says. Come back. Come back home. Come back. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.